Thank you, everybody, for coming to the Literary Cabaret 2019. <laughs> you may have gathered that there was a bit of chaos coming into this, but, you know, we want to do the show right, and um, Stefan asked that, could we have a helicopter that comes in during the second act, and I said, I don't think the building will allow us. He said, please check with them. I did, and they didn't. But we have everything but a helicopter here for you tonight. We have, we have drama and comedy. We have beautiful poetic visions. We have six wonderful musicians and 16 terrific um, writers from the Toronto, what are we called? The Toronto Writers Cooperative. <laughs> so because we didn't have time for a full walkthrough and dress rehearsal, what's going to be happening, um, performers, is that David Chilton, will be coming around and saying, you're next! And uh, he will lead you out into the hall and you'll be entering here, don't trip on the way over. There's a nice set of stairs here for anyone who needs assistance. If you're feeling young and gazelle-like, leap up on the stage and we will adjust the microphones and make sure that there'll be a little pause between numbers because we're putting different configurations of musicians and writers. So give everyone your attention. Oh, there's a very important thing to do. Cell phones. Will everybody please make sure that their cell phone is not making any obnoxious noises that will interrupt the wonderful work of these performers. Because we've had rehearsals all week and I've been really knocked out by the quality. So we are going to start the evening with M. W. Matthew W. Cook, who used to be M. W. Cook, but is now Matt W. Cook. That is now his official literary name. Matt was an evangelical preacher and missionary until he had a crisis of faith. And now he writes about our relationships with religion, spiritual disillusionment, and spiritual reconstruction. Matt lives in Toronto with his wife and kids, where he writes as if his income depended on it. He sometimes blogs at, Matt w at mwcook.com and tweets at Matt the Cook. Please welcome Matt Cook, accompanied by Dan Newman on drums. <laughs> This? Yeah, I like that. All right. First Samuel chapter 18, verses 6 to 27. Saul, king of Israel, had been wanting to murder that upstart shepherd boy David for months. Since killing the giant, David had become the most popular man in the kingdom. There was even a song about him. And now one of Saul's kids, one of his own kids, was singing it. Saul has killed his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Saul has killed his thousands, David his tens of thousands. Moron! Saul barked at Jonathan. It doesn't even rhyme. Jonathan mouthed thousands to himself. It rhymes. You can't rhyme a word with itself, Saul roared and chucked a spear. Jonathan dodged easily and ran off. A servant scurried to pick up the spear while it was still skidding across the balcony, and Saul looked at the grassy courtyard below. His daughter, Mikkel, was there, wandering about, doing that stupid waltzy walk swooning teenagers do. Between her, Jonathan, and the rest of the kingdom, it seemed everyone had fallen in love with the shepherd. If Saul couldn't figure out a way to kill him soon, he'd lose it. The problem, he declared to no one in particular, is that he's so bleeding suspicious. Why is he suspicious? Uh, sire, you have thrown spears at him. That was last week. How long is he going to hold a grudge? He took a spear and threw it at the servant, pinning him to a wall. Another servant scrambled to retrieve the spear, while a third went to clean the stain. Just then, Mikhail in the courtyard below started singing that song. Saul has killed his thousands, David his tens of thousands. Saul has killed his thousands, David his tens of thousands. If Saul hadn't been out of spears, he would have thrown one at her too. He fumed and squeezed his fists, imagining what it would be like to get that little sheep herder in his hands and tear his head right off. Following that line of thought, Saul got an idea. 
David was in his rooms, playing with Jonathan's sword and wondering when he'd get to go to war again. When a messenger from the king stepped in, David assumed the worst. Saul's not offering me one of his daughters again, is he? The messenger sniffed. The king offers you his daughter, Michal this time. David groaned and put the sword down on the table. He got up from the couch to pour himself some wine. It's a very great honor, the messenger went on. You would join the king's family and have a permanent place here in the palace. Oh, I would just die of boredom in this house with that girl. Mikhail is very fond of you. As if that makes a difference, David drank his wine in loud gulps and started pouring another cup. Give him the same answer as last time. I'm just a shepherd boy. It's not right for me to become a king's son-in-law. I don't really want to settle down right now. And if you're worried about the money, the messenger said, the king says all he wants for a bride price is foreskins. Some of the wine spilled. <laughs> David set down the cup and looked at the servant. Well, I don't have any. Philistine foreskins. A hundred taken from vanquished enemies. I'll do it, David cheered. He drained his wine and dashed out of the room. The messenger scrambled to keep up. He called, but David ignored him and went straight to the barrack courtyard where his mighty men spent all day training and showing off their pectorals. Before the servant could get David's attention, the giant slayer stood in the middle of the yard and called out, Gather round, boys, gather round. Today's job is foreskin snatching. Since there's a shortage of such skins in this city, we're heading out to Philistine country. Bring gloves, a good knife, and a bag you don't mind fight, uh, and a bag you don't mind throwing out when we're done. <laughs> Boss, how many foreskins do we need? Only 200. Now mount up. The servant tried to tell him it was only a hundred foreskins they needed, but they were already off, whooping and kicking up dust. When David returned, the king had his servant count the foreskins again and again until he was satisfied. After the fifth count, Saul would have thrown his spear at the grinning sheep herder, but he was far too drunk. He told his courtier to start planning the wedding and went to bed. During the wedding, David's song played eight times, and the wedding planner was pinned to a wall. Saul has killed his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Saul has killed his thousands, David his tens of thousands. Let's hear it again for Matt W. Cook and Dan Newman. Um, some more business. Um, every time you come up here, we're going to, if you're doing the adjustments, Nick, our marvelous sound man, will come over and adjust your mics for you. Don't worry about it. Just tell him, oh, I want it over here. I want it over here. It's too high. It's too low. Um, and he'll appreciate that. <laughs> so our next guest is A.M. Matt. A.M. Matt is an award-winning author who was, uh, who was a produced playwright by the age of eight and first published at the age of 11. More recent publications include short stories in literary magazines such as Virage, Ancrage, Luna Station Quarterly, and the collections Where Pigeons Roost and Other Stories and Ce Que L'On Divulgue. Please welcome A.M. Matt. I'll get the hang of this by the end. <laughs> and thanks for lowering the mic to my diminutive size. From foreskin to conception. I knew I'd leave my husband the moment he told the doctor at the fertility clinic that he wouldn't be providing a sperm sample. I looked down at my hands folded on my lap and took a breath. It was a decision that had been a long time coming, but when it came, it hurtled toward me like a meteor. I hadn't realized that trying to conceive a second child was my final reason for staying with him. All the history shared, the child we were raising, the love I must have once felt for him, none of that was enough. Why should I do any tests, he said to the doctor, but really to me, she's the one who wants to be here. And I thought we were in this together. Two months later, I asked for a divorce. And while it does take two, 
to make a child, I realized in that clinic room that it didn't have to be these two. I'd hung on to a broken relationship for years in order to give my son a full-blooded sibling. But once that hope was gone, a new hope blossomed. I could have a child on my own. I could pick a profile in an online catalog without having to deal with anyone but the staff at the clinic. It was liberating. I was in charge of myself again. And three months after separating from my husband, I scoured a sperm donor website. I was nursing a glass of white wine as I sat in front of my laptop. There were thousands of profiles, but one search term cut the number of hits to a manageable 26. Wanting to add to my Eastern European, Jewish, French, Canadian DNA, the color I thought I lacked, I had typed in mixed race. And from this concise list, I chose a potential two, a black Cherokee French donor, and a Japanese Chinese Filipino donor. The black Cherokee French donor's profile said, call me Pedro. Okay. When I saw a photograph of his seven-year-old face smiling at me, I felt as if I were seeing my son. It was such a powerful moment, I was sure of my choice, no matter the social judgment, no matter the reper rep repercussions of my ex-husband, this was the right thing to do. I booked an appointment to the, at the clinic to go over the intrauterine insemination process, IUI, and in, to order a semen sample from donor 6736. At the clinic's front desk, once the nurse had my name and birth date, she asked if I was having my period. First day, actually, I said, trying to sound nonchalant as if I had this type of conversation all the time. Oh, so you want to try insemination this cycle? We should get your donor sample quickly, known donor. Well, I read Pedro's profile, but I don't really like know him, know him. Which profile number? I'd come in for a consult, but left with an array of instructions to undergo the IUI that very month. Like when you enter a clothing store, just browsing, and leave with an entire new wardrobe. Except in my case, I had no buyer's remorse. None. Which is good, because you have to purchase these sperm samples and they don't accept returns. <laughs> A week of carefully monitored blood tests later, my optimal ovulating time was identified and I was scheduled for insemination. The doctor was efficient. Disrobe from waist down. Lie here, confirm donor number. Scooch a little. Feet in stirrups. Adjust light. Scooch down some more. Take a breath. Relax and sort speculum. Small chat about chosen semen sample. Observe syringe being prepped. Syringe inserted. Semen sample administered. Speculum and syringe removed. Scooch back up. Done. I'd had less romantic dates. <laughs> Stay here 10 minutes, relax, give it some time to take, come back in two weeks and we'll see if you're pregnant. Good luck, exit doctor. 10 minutes trying to will minuscule spermatozoa toward my elusive ovum. 10 minutes visualizing this feat of evolutionary biology but only conjuring up a fuzzy reminiscence of look who's talking opening credits. 10 minutes communing with my uterus, bargaining with fate. Grant me this and I'll never ask for anything again. Finally, I got dressed, made my next appointment and delicately kegled back to work, certain I was already carrying precious cargo. I wasn't. Pedro's sample and I did not conceive that January, nor did we when I tried again in February. The process was so eerily addictive, I had to stop myself from a third attempt to make sure I was still doing it for the right reasons. I decided to hit pause until the fall. For one thing, at nearly $1,500 a try, I had to be sure I could afford another attempt. After all, I had a divorce to pay for. <laughs> By the time fall rolled around, I'd been separated from my husband for a year and had started dating casually. Oh, so casually. One day during one of these encounters, a condom slipped. You'll take care of it, asked the young man, referring to the morning after pill. I considered it. I looked up the drug online and read about the side effects. 
No. I wouldn't purposefully subject my body to nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding, or more alarmingly, menstrual changes. This body that had just eight months ago tried so hard to be in today's potential predicament would take its chances, and despite my dates and treaties, I did nothing. Well, not nothing. I was making a baby. And after four years of planning for a baby with my husband, one of these years trying to have a baby despite a toxic relationships and two attempts at IUI had conceived in the most mundane way, my gorgeous, yes, mixed race, second son was born the next summer. My friends claim I wanted this baby so much I willed him into existence. My most wonderful and welcome of surprises. <laughs> Barry Zwicker, Barry at 84, is possibly the oldest TWP member. John, is that true? Currently, I think, yeah. Okay. Uh, is, the, is the oldest TWP member. He is an author, a former journalist and publisher, and a lifelong peace activist. His nonfiction book, Towers of Deception, the Media Cover-Up of 9-11, New Society Publishers in 2007, won gold in the current events category of the Independent Publisher Book Awards. About 2,400 publishers throughout the English-speaking world participate in these awards each year. So please welcome to the stage, accompanied by, once again, David Thiessen on bass, Barry Zwicker. Oh, you know what? One more thing. Um, Barry handed out um, cards that were on everyone's seat. So if we have a little, we're going to have a little bit of house light because at one point he's going to ask you to sing along with this song. Uh, in 1950, I was 16 years old, living in Swan River, a small town in northern Manitoba. And my friends and I would go to Woodward's Bakery after school, where there was a Wurlitzer, and we would drink Coke floats and cherry pie. Now that year, one of the big hits was called A Roven Kind, and it was by the Weavers. And so when I put my nickel into the Wurlitzer, here is what everybody at Woodward's Bakery heard. As I cruised out one evening upon a night's career, I spied a lofty clipper ship and to her I did steer. I heisted out my signals which she so quickly knew, and when she saw my bunting fly, she immediately hove to. She had a dark and a roving eye, and her hair hung down in ringlets. She was a nice girl. A proper girl, but one of the roving kind. Now it's going to be really easy for you to sing along with the chorus because you've heard the tune once, you have the cards that I left on every seat that have my parody words for the chorus, and David, our wonderful bassist, to enjoy working with him, is going to play the tune once, then I'm going to sing the chorus once, and then we're all going to sing it together, right? Okay. Right. That's my key. <laughs> That's the second note, I believe. As I have I got it? Yeah. She had a dark and a roving eye, and her hair hangs down in ringlets. I am a nice boy, a proper boy, but one of the guilty kind. Now, that's pretty good, but let's do it again. <laughs> okay. She has a dark and a roving eye, and her hair hangs down in ringlets. 
I am a nice boy, a proper boy, but one of the guilty kind. Okay, now I'll sing a solo, and then we're all going to sing it full blast. As I cruised out one evening upon my life's career, I spied a lofty clipper ship, and to her I did steer. She heisted up her signals, which I so quickly knew, and, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> isn't that something that I would forget that? It's a pathetic thing. And when I saw her bunting fly, I immediately hove to. She has a dark and a roving eye, and her hair hangs down and giving me She, I'm nice boy, a private boy, but one of the roving kind. Yeah, one of the roving kind, one of the guilty kind. I try to sing the old words. She gave me she gave to me some fish and chips and treated me so fine. And hardly did she realize I am the guilty kind. I kissed her lips, I missed her lips, and found to my surprise that she was nothing but a pirate ship rigged up in a disguise. She has a in roving eye, and her hair hangs down in ringlets. I am a nice boy, a big boy, but one of the roving kind. So come, all ye good sailor men who sail the wintry sea, and come, all ye apprentice lads, a warning take from me. Beware of lofty clipper ships, they'll be the ruin of you. For was there she made me walk the plank and pushed me under too. <laughs> she has a dark and roving eye and her hair hangs down in ringlets. I am a nice boy, a proper boy, but one of the roving kind. Do you wonder who's the clipper ship I saw when I set out? The one who's so alluring that I didn't have a doubt. She's the fantasy that sails the seas and never comes to shore. She's the <laughs> she's the dream of peace, but she's just on lease to tease us evermore. She has a dark and a roving eye, and her hair hangs down in ringlets. I'm a nice boy, a proper boy, but one of the roving kind. So now you may be wondering about the guilty plea I spake. <laughs> it is just this, I do insist. No. <laughs> this is, this is uh, pre-amateurish. Start it. I want to start again. It's folk. It's not amateur. <laughs> yeah. And 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 now you may be wondering about the uh, the uh, guilty plea I spake. The one that, if the court may please, could burn me at the stake. It is just this. I do confess. I hold. I hold. For the duration that I still believe there can be peace, that is my explanation. So don't join in. I'll sing the last chorus by myself. <laughs> she has a dark and a roving eye and her hair hangs down in ringlets i am a nice boy 
even a proper boy, but one of the guilty kind. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> Bravo! Oh, not that. Absolutely. Barry Zwicker, everybody, and thank you for your participation. And I'd also like to take this moment. Let me take this. Oh, by the way, Jamie Thompson, you're up in a second, so get ready. We have a hole, we have a hole in our system. We have David Chilton telling all the writers, but no one's telling the musicians. Um, <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank David Thiessen, our bass player. David studied jazz at Humber College, and while bass is his first love, he also sings and plays several instruments, including performing classic songs by crooners like Dean Martin. And now... I would like to call to the stage, after my introduction, Margaret McCaffrey, after a career writing and editing in several professional fields, Margaret McCaffrey is now concentrating on creating, uh, creative writing, mostly short stories, plays, and storytelling. Her play, The Woman from Toronto, was staged at the Alumni Theater in November of 2018 as part of Act Two Studios' Fresh Picks Festival of New Plays. Ladies and gentlemen, Margaret McCaffrey, accompanied by Jamie Thompson on flute. Well, I'm totally blinded, so I can't see any of you, which is probably a good thing. Are you set there, Jamie? Absolutely. Okay. Accents have always fascinated me. I have a somewhat mid-Atlantic accent myself. My Canadian kids explain me away to their friends by saying, see, like my mom, like she talks funny. She's English. <laughs> the, the subtext being, she can't help it. But when I go home to England, I'm told, oh, Margaret, you sound ever so Canadian. I also have an Irish family, and to them, I sound English to the core. Oh, will you listen to her with the accent and all? <laughs> Accents tell us where people are from, but they also tell us who they think they are. There's a funny thing about accents. We don't hear our own. Let me give you an example. After I'd been in Canada about six years, I went to, on a trip to Mexico. One of my fellow travelers was an Englishwoman, so I asked her where she was from. She answered, oh, I'm from England. I responded, y yes, I know. <laughs> uh, what part? Puzzled, she told me, oh, I'm from the South. Again, I said, yes, I know, what part? She started to get a bit irritated. Well, I'm from Bournemouth, actually. Oh, I said, I'm from Croydon. Her brow furrowed, and she looked completely confused. By way of explanation, I added, I live in Canada now. Light dawned, her brow cleared. Oh, she said knowingly, I thought you had an accent. <laughs> Okay, so maybe by that time my accent had become a little bit mid-Atlantic. But let me take you back to a time when I had never lived anywhere else but England. I had moved from Croydon in southeast London to Kingston-upon-Hull in what was then East Yorkshire to attend university. Now, people in the north of England are hardy, hard-working folk who pride themselves on no-nonsense plain speech. They regard Southerners as soft, lazy drifters who talk posh-like. The town-gown relationship in Hull wasn't. The townies detested students. Looking at the rooms advertised for rent in the Hull Daily Mail, you were likely to see the note, no dogs or students. <laughs> and here I was, a Southerner with a university scarf. Two strikes against me. So when I needed to buy some things for my ill-equipped student kitchen, I approached the local village shopkeepers with care, 
I needed a plastic funnel. The nearest store was what you would call here a convenience store or a variety store. There, it was the corner store, and there was nothing convenient or varied about it, I can assure you. As I opened the door, the little bell jangled. But that didn't deter the two girls behind the counter from carrying on their animated discussion of last night's adventures. I waited a few moments, then asked, Excuse me, have you got any plastic funnels? There was a moment of startled silence. Then one of the girls went... <coughs> the other one kicked her on the ankle, looked me straight in the eye and said, No, we haven't. Clearly, whatever I wanted, I wasn't getting it there. I beat a hasty retreat, and as the door closed behind me, I heard the two girls dissolve into hysterical giggles. <laughs> Not an auspicious start. The next shop in the village was more of a grocer's that sold some household items. I opened the door and cautiously approached the counter where a woman was busy stocktaking. I waited for her to look up before asking timidly, did you have any plastic funnels? She looked at me over her glasses and said, plastic flannels? <laughs> In desperation, I repeated myself, getting louder and louder. You, you know that saying, everybody speaks English if you shout loud enough? That was me. Uh, no, no, funnels, plastic funnels, funnels. Needless to say, it didn't work. She went back to her stock taking, telling me dismissively, I don't know what you're on about, love. Try the post office. <laughs> As the door banged behind me, I heard the woman mutter, bloody students. <laughs> I was in despair. Was I some kind of alien? Was I really still in my own country? I was at my lowest ebb. There was one more shop to try. What would be called here a hardware store? There and then, it was an ironmonger's. Fearfully, I opened the door, startled by the loud jangling of the bell. This time, a motherly-looking lady glanced up from filling the till with change and said pleasantly, Oh, do, love, what can I do for you? Oh, I, I do hope you can help me, I almost sobbed. You see, I, I, I'm looking for a, a plastic funnel, and nobody seems to know what I'm talking about. A plastic what, love? the lady asked. In desperation, I started to draw a funnel in the air. You know, like this. Sign language, had it come to this? But it worked. A broad smile came over the lady's face and she said, Oh, you mean a funnel. Why didn't you say? <laughs> oh, and did I tell you what I had gone to Hull to study? English. <laughs> And for Margaret McCaffrey and Jamie Thompson on flutes. So, how many mystery writers does it take to change a light bulb? How many mystery writers does it take to change a light bulb? I don't know, it's a mystery. Two! 
one to screw the bulb in almost all the way, and one to give it a final surprising twist. Our next act is here to bring us a rather mysterious story from Estonia. Please welcome Karen Ivan to the stage. Karen grew up in a writing family. Her mother is an Estonian poet, and she has been playing with words for as long as she can remember. By day, Karen writes for governments and corporations, and by night, retreats into a fantasy world with her own stories. Please welcome Karen Ivan, accompanied on, on violin by Jamie Mc. Limit. This is based on a true story. Her name was Lily. She lived in a wooden house, a beautiful, simple wooden house. The house was in the heart of a small medieval city at the edge of the sea surrounded by church spires and multi-hued buildings and curving cobblestone streets, like a gem in a perfect setting. Sometimes the sky would be so blue and so bright, it seemed like it could shatter into a thousand pieces, like a precariously hung mirror. It felt as though the house would remain standing forever. It was such an integral part of the landscape always ready to shelter whoever lived there. But Lily did not want to ever think about leaving this place because this house was hers and always would be. She turned the first page of the photo album. Lily lived in the house with her husband, a portrait photographer. It was how they met. He had taken her portrait and fallen in love. Lily didn't really care about things like that, to be admired, to be immortalized. Truth be told, she felt a bit apart from it all, but she respected the finesse, the control that it took to create such art. Oh, the parade of people who came into that house. This was the time when everyone would aspire to have their portrait taken, to prove they had the means the gentility to commission such photos. They would dress carefully, look so polished and smart. The children were well behaved, they didn't dare act up. Her husband would take their photos and it was all so formal. They didn't smile, didn't blink an eye. That's the way everyone wanted them. To know that they, to show that they knew this formality, that it was not foreign to them. Lily turned several more pages in the album. There were so many people who were part of this house who left an indelible mark. They were all marvelous in their own way. To see them coming and going, the hustle and bustle of it all, it was predictable and reassuring somehow. And exciting, yes, it was exciting too. At night, they would have the most wonderful gatherings. So many interesting people would stop by. There were painters and writers, artists and historians. They would become people of some renown, but they didn't realize it then. They were young, they were carefree and clever. They laughed and they danced. They smoked so many cigarettes, the air would blew with smoke. The photographs that lined the walls would become hazy. Sometimes it was hard to see them. Lily turned another page. Some of the rooms were decorated with very distinctive wallpaper. It was the fashion of the day to have such wallpaper. It was proof of your good taste, of your ability to buy and appreciate such things to know how to place furniture and objects just so. It was an art. But Lily loved the rooms best in which there was no wallpaper, where the walls were just plain wood without adornment, where there was not one single photograph. She would run her hands over the wood and marvel at how smooth and seamless the planks were. 
She loved to sit in these rooms by herself, surrounded by the wooden walls. They were like a cloak, a warm cloak. She would imagine a kind of safety that could never be questioned. She turned another page. There were no more pictures for a long time. It's always curious when a photo album begins with the greatest of intentions, and then the pictures stop abruptly. It's as if the person responsible for it loses interest or is interrupted in some way. When the aggressors came, the house lost its meaning for Lily. People came to stay who had no right to be there. Large cement block tenement buildings were erected around the house to provide shelter to those who suddenly needed it. She didn't know where they came from. Nothing made sense anymore. The album slipped to the floor. Lily's spirit retreated, retreated into the wooden walls and became quiet. There was no urgency anymore. One day, many decades later, an artist came to the wooden house. He stood in the doorway. He had heard about the house and how it had once been a celebrated kind of gathering place. He didn't really know why he was there, what he was supposed to do. As he walked around his in inside, his footsteps echoed in the cold, empty rooms. There was a faint smell of wood, of damp, of fire. It was not unpleasant. The wooden walls were bare, but still very beautiful. He ran his fingers over the wood, feeling the texture. There was something there that pulled at him, and he returned to the house day after day to paint. He painted portrait after portrait of faces of women, large canvases, one after the other. It was like a constant tapping on his shoulder. The cold winter came and went. Sometimes he'd be so tired, he'd sleep in an old clawfoot tub that had strangely remained in place in the house. He kept painting. His last portrait was of Lily. It was, as, it was as if she had emerged from the walls of the house and taken up residence once more. She had been waiting for him. It was how they met. He painted her portrait and fell in love. Mm -hmm. Give it up for Karen Ivan and Jamie McLennan. I'm going to call your name all night. McLennan. McClement. I'm sorry. This is like this one thing a host has to do, you know? Just one. Th okay, but now I'll have to do something else. First of all, I have to call up. Uh, uh, I'm going to call up Zuhaib Shazada to the stage to join me. J. Marshall Freeman is a novelist and musician, two-time winner of the Saints and Sinners Fiction Contest. He chose to be here tonight to host this event instead of being in New Orleans to receive his award tonight. I'm going to be singing for you um, a song called Don't Lose Me which has been floating around my head for a lot of years, but I finished it last year for the um, 30th anniversary of my, myself and my partner. And um, But he's in China, so you know, you have to clap louder. Uh, <laughs> okay, so um, they will be ready in a moment. I'll prepare. Seriously, you don't know how little voice you have after a whole week like this. All right, how are you doing? I'm going to turn a little bit so I can see you, Zuhaib. And... All right, this is rock and roll. Just chill. That's not rock and roll. Uh... 
I'll say one more thing about the song while I'm uh, while the microphones are being set up. I'm a huge fan of Jacques Brel, and I think this is as close to a uh, Jacques Brel kind of song as I've written. Um, it's not as good as Jacques Brel, but. Sorry, I just want to block your singer. No problem. Although I don't want him too far back. I want to see him. We got, we got, a, we got, a, nod, we got a nod. We got a nod to each other. Okay. Just up to the front a bit there. Okay. So he has lots of room. Okay. Perfect. Uh, I don't want to touch your mic, so uh, I'll let you pick, bring me up a bit. Who's this? Uh, yeah, great. Thank you. You're so welcome. All right. That sounds good. Oh, I don't need any of this. <sighs> don't lose me. I stumble through unknown jungles blind with lions ferocious close behind. I need you to guide me. Don't lose me in the crucible of love. Don't lose me. I hang from the cliff and hold my breath. A slip of a finger from my death I need you to reach for me Don't lose me In the crucible of love Don't lose me I bang on the bars and curse my choices Beating back meekly at the voices I need your forgiveness Don't lose me don't lose me, don't lose me in the crucible of love. Thank you. Zahib Shazada. Two more acts left in our first half, and then, by the way, we have purchased some soft drinks by now, and they are out there waiting with the rest of the food. So, um, at this time, I am going to um, bring Jamie back to the stage to play some more violin, and he will be playing for the next two numbers. And um, our next writer is Matthew Gordon. Matthew is a writer of short fiction and nonfiction. He has been a member of the Toronto Writers Cooperative since 2010 and has appeared in, in its compilation Voices since 2016. Please give a round, a round, a warm round, a round warm of applause for Matthew Gordon. <laughs> there is a place where I have gone and what I hope most is that you'll visit. It is grassy and green and alive with sun the way you would have always wanted it. With trees overhead and a stream nearby and a church down a hill and flowers on my rooftop, it really will be quite nice. A charm exists in the quiet solitude of the wood. It's peaceful there and cool and calm with so little to ever bother a soul. Trees lurk over the plot of grass I call mine 
as much as anyone can ever call land one's own. You will be no less joyous to me than you were before. More so if I have gained any greater ability to see you as you are from this experience. What I know is that we will never fight again and that whatever you say, I will hear more attentively than anyone could have thought. We will laze in contented silence, the only sound of your breathing on my ears. Please walk beside me, prance about in the sun showers as I bask in their glow, and yours. Hold me, but not my hand. Love me in spirit, the way I will always love you. Don't join me there. It's not that the meadow is too beautiful, or the grass too well kept, or the leaves too low hanging. It's just that some things are meant to be done alone. Alone as the church bells chime and the clouds gather. It's raining on my skylight. When the night falls, walk away from me in the splashing drops that dot your boots. Bask in the moonlight, but spare some from my granite door. Leave me be, so I may hibernate within the cage of roots that holds me dearer than any but you. There is nothing I treasure more than an endless memory that combines the past into one. The first time we met and the last time we kissed are indistinct to me now. There is only what has gone, but is not gone, in the errors of reflection that lie ahead. In yesterday and tomorrow, you see two worlds where I see only one. I used to see two worlds as you did. Then I changed. Don't change with me, my love. Not now. For I'm united with peace, but tension still stirs with you, and peace is where I end. Rest well, my love, and someday you may find me. Matthew Gordon. And I might as well take the opportunity to introduce Jamie McLennan. I can't do this. Jamie McLennan. You see, you have this Y in here that should be an E. So it's, it's, it's McClymond. McClymond. That's right. Like climate change. <laughs> and actually, you're, you're studying environmental science, so it's very appropriate. Okay. Jamie McClymond has been playing music since he was a child. During his short stay on planet Earth, Jamie has developed a fascination with natural sciences and the climate. When he's not playing music, he can be found in Scarborough where he's currently studying environmental science at Centennial College. And now he will be joined by none other than Norman Allen. And let me tell you about Norman Allen, if I can find my place. Here we are. Dr. Norman Bethune Allen is a practitioner of alternative medicines, a scientist specializing in neurophysiology and animal behavior, and alternative medicine in, and alternative medicine. He is a painter, a writer, a stalwart of the writing community and the poetry community in this city. Norman Allen, please. Do you need a I need this. All right. Here's what I want. I want you guys like faced off like prize fighters because that's what you are. A word about a word. A word about a word. In the scattering of the Jewish people, the diaspora, those who went to the east are the Mizrahi. Those who went to the west are the Sephardim. 
Those who went to the north are the Ashkenazi. The Ashkenazi. Those who went south are of the lost tribes. Whose voice is this? It's funny who speaks. The Cockney boy is not me. It's the memory of my teens tithing my tongue to a person. And it's not me. I'm American Ashkenazi. Ashkenazi, my good lord, a mortal enemy, a nemesis branded into onto our name. And I'm slipping down some Freudian and paranoid, satanically insignificant red herring. It's funny who speaks. It's never quite me. Whose voice is this? It's funny who speaks. The Cockney boy's not me. It's the memory of my teens tithing myself to a person. It's not me. I am American Ashkenazi. Ashkenazi, my good lord, a mortal enemy, a nemesis branded into onto our name. And I'm tripping down some Freudian and paranoid, satanically insignificant red herring. It's funny who speaks. It's never quite me. Whose voice is this? Mid-Atlantic off the City Isles. Whose voice is this? The Cockney boy's not me. It's the memory of my teens tithing myself to a person. It's not me. I'm American Ashkenazi. Ashkenazi, my good lord. A mortal enemy, a nemesis, branded into onto our name. And I'm tripping down some Freudian and paranoid, satanically insignificant red herring. It's funny who speaks. It's never quite me. Whose voice is this? Reincarnation. In my last incarnation, I was a bleeding sheep. I followed the sunshine gladly. I remember the journey to slaughter, stock car, stockyard, electric prod and stung gun, all your humanity. Baba Black ain't coming back waiting your curse, your knife. Now I'm lamb chops. In my last incarnation, I was a bleeding sheep. I followed the sunshine gladly. Remember the journey to slaughter, stock car, stockyard, electric prod and stun gun, all your humanity. Baba Black ain't going back. Oh, waiting your curse, your knife, my life. Now I'm lamb chops. In my last incarnation, I was a bleeding sheep. I followed the sunshine gladly. Remember the journey to slaughter, stock car, stock car electric prod and stun gun, all your humanity. Baba Black ain't going back when you curse your knife. Now I'm Lamb Chops. <laughs> you don't bow down to love. You don't bow down to love. You open your heart. Love is an option. Love is an option. Love is an option. Open the heart. Love is an option. Love is an option. Love is an option. Open the heart. You don't bow down to love. You don't bow down to love your blood. I was puzzled that <laughs> I've run on too far. The thing is, you don't bow down to Jesus. Just open your heart and say, love is an option. You don't bow down to love. You don't bow down to love. You open your heart. Love is an option. Love is an option. Love is an option. Open the heart. Love is an option. Love is an option. Love is an option. Open the heart. The thing is, you don't bow down to Jesus. Just open your heart and say, love is an option. You don't bow down to love. You don't bow down to love. You open your heart. Love is an option. Love is an option. Love is an option. Open the heart. Love is an option. Love is an option. Love is an option. Open the heart. I was puzzled that in my room where I'm surrounded by Buddhas and Hindu gods, there's no Jesus. I, I whirled round and then settled down and realized the thing is, you don't bow down to Jesus, just open your heart and say love is an option. You don't bow down to love, you don't bow down to love, you open your heart. Love is an option, love is an option, love is an option, open the heart. Love is an option, love is an option, love is an option, open. That was tremendous. Thank you. That was our first half. Um, we're going to take a 15-minute break. Go out and get some food, get some drink, go get your stuff from the bar. And we will be back in 15 minutes with a very special presentation from a company 
of dancers and poets and uh, everything. Cheers. <laughs> Rife with the trepidation of a tempest's toll, a trudging patrol drags their fraying satchels through the coastal desolation, overburdened with arcane guidance from fable-encrusted equipment. The hapless rescue sees only a roiling sea, battering cairns of woe. You and I, love, that forged an outpost high on a dizzying bluff. Its wind-blasted door now staggers in unwelcome delirium. As a horn echoes seaward, o'erhead the storm-pocked shingling, commanding the reticent loading out of sacred stores. Closer to the froth, a platform rocks askew on shattered pylons. Crafted as a lookout, anchored against the cloy of raging tides. Slack tendrils have loosed bonds of this driftwood corset, signaling abandonment of its meaningful employ. A head hangs, tilted on the lichen-slick precipice. Unrelenting slaps of spray stream into caustic rivulets etching ciphered map lines that obscure his forlorn face. I've become an apparition. An outcrop is my imprisoning throne. I'm waiting on a trident's bolt to strike out in retribution. A counter to the shuddering stasis of my sodden body. Today! Browning Hulk lays exhausted off to the side. Its splintered planks and split spilt provision mock propitious resurrection. There is no broken mast or tattered sail, nor there ever were. This vessel was need be propelled by calloused hands lumbering on oars. My erstwhile companion, you've drifted in the gray scape of sorrows, rudderless. Your uncertain quests become captured in dooming eddies, transfixed by a siren shrieking from realms of lament therein. In better times, there'd been other precocious wayfarers, probing celestial charts with glints on sextant, wielding furled pipettes fit with glass monocled brass, on board, they dispelled illusionary boundaries, a deft clamber among snaring puzzles of netted rope. Unbridled, these cadet comrades set an intrepid course, boldly casting off toward other horizons in buoyant, unfolding lives. A once full company felt secure that a steadfast guardian was watching, scanning an ambiguous sky's complexion for telltale clouds. Fiercer of fog-bound storms roll shoreward with insidious fury, so even a dutiful watchman fails in calling weather soon enough. In drowning vain, the howling of premonitions is muted, so dire resignation now floods these souls' creviced caverns where in regret swamps the absolution, the refuge of absolution, seizing its sullen place. I'm sorry I couldn't help us heed the foreboding of doldrums. I am sorry that my wild flailing sculpted unscalable crags. I bemoan my faltering navigation through vain shipwreck metaphors, unbecoming to this ruptured traverse of love's vast expanse.
Great, thank you to Stefan Dröge and company for Silesia's Tears. Oh, these aren't the right pieces of paper, just hold on. Haya was born and raised in Germany. She spent most of her life creating and performing mask and puppet theater in Canada, the USA, Germany, and Mexico. Since 2016, she has lived in Toronto where she is working on her memoirs. And Haya will be accompanied by Jamie Thompson on flute. A walk with Say. <clears throat> Say is the name of my Mexican great-grandson. He is seven years old and stays with me Wednesday afternoons. Last time, we first played memory, at which game he always wins and his self-esteem rises to loud laughter and great joy. <clears throat> when we went, then we went for a walk below our property. The road, which once was the old Antigo Camino a Santa Ana, ends today after 15 minutes in plain nature and a great pile of dirt. Since the big road, the Carretera Santa Ana, was renovated some years ago and tons of soil were thrown over our little one. We walked happily along first searching and finding a hiking stick for say. Then an old single shoe had to, f <clears throat> wait a minute. Then an old single shoe had to be examined. And finally, a rather thick and curiously flat stone was discovered which Say took along because he thought it might be useful at home. His house momentarily is under construction. Coming to the end of the little road and listening to my explanation about why it ended here, he surprised me by saying, Tambien es bonito. This is also nice. On the way back, an old broken white dinner plate sticking out of a pile of rubble on the side of the road held Say's attention. He put aside his stick and stone pulled out the half plate, cleaned it, and said somewhat with a question, Para una casadilla? My great-grandmother's instinct made me agree, and so he picked up his stone again, put it closely to his new plate, all in one hand, and with the other took up his stick and followed me walking on. <clears throat> Just before we reached our property, 
we saw bushes to both sides of the road with long open pods filled with white wing-like seeds, just waiting to be blown down by the next wind. Say lifted his stick by pressing his stone and half plate firmly against his body and hit one of the brushes nearest branches, like children will do, not thinking much. Yet what a surprise! The seeds, like snowflakes, fell slowly to the ground. At first in awe, sharing the miracle with me, he then turned the place into a deep winter's night, as the song goes. <clears throat> Only when there was not a single seat left in the bushes around us, and the road was covered with this wonder snow, we slowly and happily walked home. Thank you very much, Haya and Jamie. That was beautiful. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Jamie to you. He is the author of the critically acclaimed Urban Flute Project, a founding member of the Junction Trio, now celebrating their 10th season as, as the St. Anne's Ensemble in Residence. In fact, you'll see these flyers uh, around, and there's a performance coming up on April 7th that Jamie would love you to come out to at four o'clock, which apparently it doesn't say in here. And uh, Jamie is a gifted teacher and performer and recognized both internationally and here in Canada. Now for our next uh, act, I welcome back Dan Newman on drums and David Thiessen on bass. And um, this will be performed by Dora, oh sorry, um, by Dorothea DeLacy, except it won't be because Dorothea DeLacy is unfortunately ill tonight. However, she said she really wants her piece read, and so for tonight, I am going to be Dorothea DeLacy, um, although there are big shoes to fill as she is a wonderful performer, even though she doesn't seem to realize how good she is. And so this is the Smokin' Havana Browns, which she says will one day be turned into a song and be an international hit because of all the cigar stores that are around these days. So you're gonna, this, so. Is, Joanne, this is the prop that she wanted. Oh, she wanted this prop, which I don't know how to use. Uh, <laughs> wait, just a, okay, um, all right, one thing after another. <laughs> oh, I, I can't use a prop and do the text cold. Okay, so, um, uh, give Dan a beat and uh, I'll go when I feel like it. Smokin' Havana Browns, round and long. Castro's Cohibas, the choice of rebels. Cigar babies with eyes of steel, you can be my pirate, we'll start a revolution. A Cuban love story, there's no embargo on this cargo. 
Your horse won the race. I want to kiss your sexy face. Sexy, sexy, sexy cigar, baby. Hola. Smoking Havana Browns, the devil may care in Harlem, but the parlor is where is charms him. You played the hand you were dealt, well, that got you out of this hell. One white witch who likes to fly high, your ship has come in. Are you ready for the next chase? Sexy, sexy, sexy cigar, baby. Who am I to say you have made your heart clean? You are pure from sin. The way of a ship is by sea, but the way of a man is by a woman. The way of a good cigar is Cuban. Dance with me caliente style in this Havana, savanna. I love to see you smile. Sexy, 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 sexy cigar, baby. Those are the words of Dorothea DeLacy. <laughs> Who describes herself as a simple home and hearth girl that greatly enjoys walking around the different neighborhoods of the many cultural communities at home and afar from the per for the purpose of appreciating others and their lifestyles. I'd also like to take a moment to introduce, uh, to, um, Introduce Dan Newman. Dan has been playing drums for over 30 years and played professionally across Europe. He now plays with bands and artists across Toronto and teaches drums as well at various schools. I don't know if you can see his new bass drum. His new bass drum is a wonderful, how old is it? It's like a 1960 uh, suitcase. <laughs> Um, I have no idea what's going on now. Wait. <laughs> and now I'd like to welcome to the stage Jennifer Rosser, who will be sharing some of her poetry with us with the accompaniment from Dan. Jennifer's creative CV is a zine and performance base spanning two decades and five cities. Jennifer is now based in Hamilton, where she is working on producing less ephemeral work for recording and publication. Please welcome Jennifer Rosser to the stage. Darkness. What is it that I keep so far inside? To you, it seems, my vault is open wide. I rage, I cry, I laugh, share cutting wit. Seem calm or worried, that's not half of it. Below the surface, darkness overflows. It rises to my eyes and dims their glow. Drowned emotions bloat beneath the waves. Skeletons are piled in unmarked graves. Cyborg wires connect and pull me down into a field where only poison's sown. Gothic music swells unstoppably, a hurricane of grieving melody. I see the world burn to a lifeless shell. I see its people caught under a spell, bound in silence to their cold machines, barely there, alone within a dream. Screaming secretly the same as me, trapped in the bargain of postmodernity. <clears throat> <clears throat> Empty. She opened her change purse. A flea jumped from the dusty void. An infernal flea! Her reservoir of patience drained. She flung the pouch of nope at the shelf of demagnetized cassettes. In a desultory and histrionic fashion, though she had no audience, she had fled to the end of the road, burned all the bridges on the way, and run out of gas. Her old school tantrum escalated as she stomped toward the desk in her grubby pajamas opened the tower of manila folders one by one, dumped them out onto its odious surface, and swept her hand across the debris until the floor was white with her wasted life.
<clears throat> the veil. White gauze. She's peering through white gauze. It's wrapping her mouth and hands, muffled words and groping paws. A thick web. She's stumbling through gossamer threads, blind, mute, numb, but not yet dead, flailing, guessing at what's ahead. She falls down, lets the shroud wrap her body around, feels herself hanging upside down. Who's her captor? Unknown. <clears throat> Just a bit lighter. The context for this is that I've taken too many mindfulness courses. <laughs> no, there's no such thing as too much meditation. Ode to a raisin. As I hold you, I can feel that life has dried you out and given you ridges and fissures like a bedroughtened desert canyon waiting for rain but droughtened, that never comes, like the face of a wise crone. You are soft and pliable, but only so much, and your translucent skin protects you from my tender squeezing. If I hold you up to the sun, I can see your golden essence glowing. If I listen very hard, I can hear your voice and your understated soprano message. Your potent tannic perfume, reminiscent of aromatic bitters, inspires and invigorates me. I make love to your small nub of joy with my lips and tongue, with wonder, reverence, gratitude, and anticipation, and finally break you open until your sweetness bursts forth and nourishes my heart and soul. I am so glad that I took the time to get to know you. Thank you. This has been your unprepared moment for the evening. All right. So where are we? We're doing really well. This is going great. I can't believe how good everybody is. Can we have a round of applause for all these amazing performers? And while we're at it, a round of applause for our, sound, uh, for our light and stage designer, Stefan Droga, who's running lights as well as designed it, turned this cold place into a warm hearth for us all. And uh, thanks you to Nick Petrini, our amazing uh, sound man. And here's an appeal um, for a bit of help when we finish the whole evening. We need to get all the chairs stacked and moved into a corner. And if anybody can stick around a little bit and has room in a car, I could really use a lift with a bunch of gear and a piano back to my place. So talk to me after. <laughs> um, We lost it for the evening. All right, where am I? <laughs> okay, right now we are going to have another special theatrical performance by none other than Holly Dworsky, featuring Bill Clark and myself, who you've gotten sick of, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> Holly Dworsky lived in Poland, Israel, Africa, and Canada, traveled a lot, everywhere, was deeply surprised at what she found, took some notes and eventually wrote about it. So we're going to need a little minute to set up here. What's yes, the difference between a writer and a large pizza? <laughs> a large pizza can feed a family of four. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Do his fellow, he passes away, and his soul is in perfect balance, and he has the option to go to heaven or to go to hell. And so, um, you know, first, uh, he, and he says, I'm not sure which I uh, want to go to. So death takes him 
uh, first to hell, and all the writers are chained to desks, typing away vigorously in a lake of fire, the air acrid with brimstone. They're being whipped with barbed wire lashes. He's like, that does not look very good at all. Please let me see heaven. He goes to heaven, and all the authors are chained to desks, (laughs) fire lapping at them, the air acrid with brimstone being whipped with with, uh, barbed wire lashes. And he's like, well, this seems to be the same. And death says, no, here you get published. (laughs) Bill has been waiting his whole life for a real rim shot. (laughs) Okay. And now, this is the dream exchange. A young man meets his hero and finds him full of doubt and only human after all. Welcome, Mr. Yavin. Hello, I'm glad to be back. Drawer, you worked independently. At last, you did achieve maturity. Tomorrow, you're starting in the special institution for me. Um, Yes, you are starting in the special institution for me. Congratulations, then. So, this is reality. Here, there is a need to work fast, to hit a quantity, since they are subsidized for now by all kinds of sources. Not such a good pay if you delay. But after I practice on them and on myself, I will advance my theory and have a name. Then I will advance all of you including them. Let's sit down. I've gotten close to the solution and the cure. What should be activated in the brain for total healing? I know. And how to do it? Almost, also. Just keep high, don't sink, don't fall low. Yet to expedite, to use the best labs overseas, I have to leave again. And then, yes, I intend to gain appreciation then from certain groups of people that are very important Europeans. Tall, thin, cultured, sophisticated. And in control of certain countries abroad, although they are hiding that. Those who took from us everything, even the looks, and always mocked our parents after that, and yet got away with that, my cat. They caused our troubles killed us, disinherited us, blamed every disaster that they had caused on us, and always got away free, without punishments. Therefore think that it will still be the same, that the future will be shining down on them. But what has changed and good for us, my friend? They've gotten careless. Not so cautious at the end. Getting close to them is the thing. And what happens to me after that? Well, doesn't matter anymore. Of course I have. We have a plan. Maybe a final one. Still, for me, still, for me, for us, After that dangerous cleanup in South America, few possibilities are left. But I cannot tell, tell you yet, all of that. I think that the cure is so close, my cat. I hope that you, please, dear, guard our coop right here. After a few words, he got silent. So what is all this maturity? 
to admit the fact that all my dreams were lost with it for me? No! We better reach a compromise. Maybe thus we will advance the aims for both of us. Let's exchange our positions then. And let's exchange with each other our respective dreams as well. If this is what you want, I will be just a father then. And you'll be the great hero, dying again. What the hell? Okay, Troy. Good luck. Okay, boss. Thanks, then. And welcome. Again. A round of applause for Holly Dworsky there in the percussion pit with Dan Newman. All right. Our next performance is a translation of a Russian song by none other than Efim Chanis, who apparently is not the oldest member of our writers' co-op. And um, Efim will be joined by Jordan Clap. Uh, Jordan Clapman on uh, keyboards and by Zuhaib on guitar. You know, this evening's starting to wear on me, I'm sorry. Um, by Zuhaib on guitar, and I will be staying on stage to um, give moral support to Ephem. Ephem Chenis emigrated to Canada in 1995 from St. Petersburg, Russia, where he worked for many years as a researcher. He is a co-author of the book, How to Find a Job in Canada, which was published in 2008 by Oxford University Press. A few years ago, Ephem started writing memoirs and fiction stories. He is a member of the Writers Union of Canada. And now Ephem will tell us what we're about to hear. Hi, everybody. This song is from a Russian musical movie. Jolly Fellows, which was created in 1934. You can watch this movie with English subtitles on the internet for free. And it is very famous and funny movie. You will laugh from the beginning to the end. I translated this song from Russian to English by myself. The problem was not in translation, but how to match the English version with original music. So I, I hope I did it well. The name of the song, My Heart. This world is full with pretty girls. This world is full with tender names. But only one I will remember, only one my dream in peace will take away. My love will come without warning. I never knew when it will come. And every night will full of light when love spread out her wings. And I will sing my heart I want to work without resting My heart I like this land, I like the sky My heart I like to hear your beating Thank you then you can love and you can cry.
I like this land, I like this sky. My heart, I like to hear your beating. Thank you, my dear. Then you can love and you can cry. FM Chenis. Our guitar and piano band is going to stay up here for the next number. Um, don't know what that was. I'm sure it wasn't important. And um, let me take the opportunity to introduce Jordan Clapman on piano. Jordan is a pianist, vocal, and silent film accompanist band leader, music director, and, and popular music educator. He specializes in 20th century popular music, including Dixieland, jazz, Latin, and early rock and roll. Um, and I'd like to bring to the stage our last poet, but our, not our last performance, Poet, write, poor poet, uh, writer. This is Laura Kuhlman, who every morning before she puts on her lab coat, transforms into a writer of fiction. When she's not working on her first novel, a mystery that brings together detectives and researchers in the search for a mysterious new drug, Laura writes flash fiction. Please welcome to the stage, Laura Kuhlman. I didn't think of this as poetry, but uh, I, I don't, I understand where it's coming from. <laughs> Neptune. The whoosh grows into a howl. It sounds like a hurricane is building up in the corner of my living room. I hit the piano keys louder, hoping to drown the noise with music. The air is still. No wind brushes my cheek, yet the noise raises behind me. I peek over my shoulder. The planet Neptune spins furiously behind me. I gasp as it grows larger and approaches the piano. Thin rings, the color of silver, shine around it. Wonder chases my fear away. How did it get here? Did I conjure its presence from the astronomy almanac sitting on my bookshelf? My fingers push harder against the keys. The louder the music, the faster the planet spins. It rolls through the air until it rests suspended over the ivories. The deep sea blue is mesmerizing. Methane clouds run around the planet in linear uh, patterns. In the lower half of the sphere, though, they break and bend around a dark blue spot. I recognize it. The long-lasting hurricane of Neptune's southern hemisphere looks like a timid eddy from my chair. I stare at its beauty without slowing my play. The song is my lifeline, keeping me safe from the stormy planet. Suddenly, Neptune descends against my piano. Scared, I pick up the rhythm of my song. The planet slams into the woodheader. Tiny, dark blue beads fly off at the point of contact as Neptune grinds itself against the shellac. The blue sphere flattens while the beads rain against the keys. They bounce off the ivory whites with little plinks before they plunge quietly towards the carpet. I keep playing and the beads keep pouring until only a tiny clump is left. The former gas giant now knocks rhythmically against the piano, a steady cadence like that of a watch, counting off seconds, reminding me I need to be somewhere. I spring up the steps towards the rehearsal room. I sit in front of the grand piano and rotate my wrists to warm them up. The dark blue band captures my eyes. The remains of the planet Neptune are woven together into a wristlet.
Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you to Laura Kuhlman for that beautiful piece. <laughs> Make her run back in in the dark, tripping over everything. Uh, okay, and we are almost at the end of our evening. We have a very special, unique performer who you know by the name of Rob Bergeron. Rob will be bringing us his unique vision on voice and guitar. Rob is as those of you who come to the group know, slowly constructing a book called Screwball City. He's a composer and a painter, as well as a mover, a driver, and a piano tuner. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rob Bergeron. There he is, coming up from the back. <laughs> yeah, so we'll just need a minute to set him up. I originally, was going to begin with a barn burner, but I'm not going to do that because it's been mellow. So I was working on um, a poem from a long time ago when I had a sweetheart and we were, we were um, kind of going to the, the sandy shores. Anyways, it's called By the Moonlight, so I should like to do the poem, and then I'm gonna do the tune. So we'll start with the poem, and it goes like this. Once I made a fire on the sandy shore of a shaking lake, a very pretty fire, twisting and winding around the whipping winds of the night air, the wood was gathered and piled about, and as Mother Moon bloomed and her bright lights of white and red revealed the primordial jewels of heaven upon her bosom, I asked my lovely girlfriend if I may kiss her by the moonlight. As we walked hand in hand in bare feet, squishing the sand between our toes as the waves ebbed and flowed up to our ankles. And as we returned to the fire, why we were all squeezy and all shyly and all giggly wiggly, geez, I didn't know what to do by the moonlight. <laughs> so I... And we began to glow like, well, like the moonlight. <laughs> and as the embers turned blue and yellow and orange, well, we...
once I saw you sitting by the fireplace and I kissed you I took you to another place away from here For the barn burner? Yes. Oh. oh, hang on now. This is heavy. You got the sound right now? I need this thing flipped up, flipped up, flipped over, flipped down, flipped up. That wasn't a full version of the Moonlight, by the way, but that's all I can remember because I've been sitting in the back there having some. <laughs> okay, you know what I mean? Like I'm the last on, you know, the last guy to go, right? <laughs> Anyways, for those in the writing group here, Bill, especially, I love Bill. Thank you. I love you. Thank you. No, he's probably, and David too. They're the two guys that are like my, kind of like cheerleaders in my corner, right? Anyways, they know I've been constructing this strange novel called Screwball City. All right? So for the past two weeks, I've been doing... Uh, an examination of my work, a synopsis, if you want to call it. And it, it's been arduous. It's been like, uh, like revelatory, um, enhancing, elevating, and all this other kind of stuff. So, there are two kinds of characters in my book, Screwball City. There's the hooli man, and there's the screwballs of Screwball City. The hooli men are trying to save the screwballs of Screwball City. Okay, they're trying to save their souls, which is the main thematic device of the book. It's the idea of saving your soul, not forfeiting your soul, not re uh, 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 um, uh, what's the, um. 
lamenting her soul, or, 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 or I, I gotta stop at that word, but anyways. So, I made some copious notes here. Very difficult here, this is gonna be hard. Before I go to the tune, because there's a main um, thematic device that, 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 that guides this, this novel that I'm doing, um, Screwball City, and it's the idea of uh, saving one's soul and not forfeiting one's soul. I always use the words forfeit, okay? Because it's, it's a rough world out there and uh, it's really, and the idea of keeping yourself it gets more and more difficult, right? So anyways, I'm not going to get all... Anyways. So. Barn yeah, the barn burner's coming, Mark. But first, I've got I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta to do the, the quick premise here, all right? So. In Screwball City, there is a main hooli man called Opie Doperus. He's the leader of this lateral thinking church called Tree Bell Church. It's located at the north end of Square Circle Park. Square Circle Park is where all the screwballs congregate, and they've all gone mad. And the hooli men are trying to save their souls. And this, this area, it's, it's near the Forest of Fragility, and, and, and it's flanked by the magnanimous murmuring words of the shaking lake, okay? And that's, that's what they gravitate towards, right?